Hello folks. I'm trying to see if I can uh, get this thing rotated. Right, apparently that view that way is locked so I can't turn the camera sideways. Just put this up right here. Ah. How are you guys doing today? Good morning, morning. And a nice Saturday morning. I am on my way to Connecticut from Portland, Maine. For those of you who live in the US and on the East Coast, you'll probably uh, journey. Drive. So I thought, what's better than to have a live chat so you guys can keep my company, yeah? <laughs> It won't, the chat won't be a five hour, a four hour live chat though. Morning from South Africa. I'm hoping I can visit uh, South Africa one day soon. Benin, Benin, yeah. Where are you guys all from? Ready, let's do this. Yeah, man, I'm definitely coming to Africa. I've never been anywhere to Africa. Uh, growing up in Jamaica, a lot of the reggae musicians, you know, they tour Africa. And they always have a wonderful experience. Senegal, yeah, Miami, Florida. You know, my wife wants to move to Florida. She's been like telling me for the past two years, she's like, let's get out of Maine. It's way too cold, let's go to Florida. But I'm afraid of the hurricane, man. You guys get hit like every year in Florida, yeah? Kenya, Georgia, Atlanta. Georgia, Atlanta is nice. A buddy of mine just moved up from Atlanta. He's a drummer. He's one of the drummers for our church. And he just moved up from, from Georgia. Welcome to Miami. I like Miami though, because it would be like, uh, I think it's like 40 minute flight to Jamaica. I could go home for the weekend and back. That would be great. Suriname, yeah, Suriname. My cousin worked in Suriname for a while. She loved it. Hello from Berlin, Germany. Another place I haven't been, man. I haven't been anywhere in Europe yet. Yeah, definitely would want to go to Germany. Man, you guys, you guys live in some, some cool places. So, all right. What I want to talk to you guys about today, France. Oh, welcome. France. When I was at USM, an uh, international student from France visited a girl, and we were pretty good friends. She was trying to teach me French, but man, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. There's, that's one of my biggest block, learning languages. I've took French in school, I've took Spanish, and I'm completely horrible at both of them. My wife is Puerto Rican. So she speaks fluent Spanish and we've been married five years and I still don't know nothing about Spanish. <laughs> uh, so that, 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 that's something I need to work towards, you know, just to be able to learn a second language. I think that would be good for me, you know? But anyway, let's jump into the topic of discussion for today. Becoming a well-rounded pianist. You know, what does that mean? well-rounded well to me it means that you you gotta have all your bases covered you gotta have all the different areas or constantly be working on all the different areas to be a well-rounded pianist because a lot of us just tends to focus on chords what's up my man from the UK a lot of us just tend to focus on chords. This thing is always falling down. An issue at the piano, not a lot of chords. You know, that's what, especially when people say, I want to learn to play piano by ear. We just think 
I just need to learn some chords and then I'll be all set. But did you know that chord, learning chords is actually about like 25% of the journey of being able to play by ear? Only about 25%. So when you just focus on chords, you're only focusing on just about 25% of your development. And you learn some triads and you say, my chords sound boring and uninteresting. I need to probably learn some sevens. And if I learn some sevens, then I'd be better at this. You learn some sevens and your playing still sound basic and, uh, you know, not very interesting. And so I'm here to tell you that chords, learning chords is great, but it's only about a quarter of the work. There are other areas just as important as learning chords. Application of what I know, that's another thing too. So you have some people that have a lot of the theoretical understanding, but none of the practical. And I'm gonna break down all of the, uh, the different areas for you. Again, in my opinion, what you think you need to becoming a well-rounded pianist. First, let's start with the theory. That's one part of it. Theory. A lot of people shy away from theory because they think, oh, theory is for people who want to learn how to read music. No. In fact, theory is more important for people who want to play by ear. If you want to play by ear, you got to become a student of theory. So that's one aspect. What are some of the things that involves in theory? It understand, um, it, it, uh, theory helps you to understand the why, the why things work. So when you see a chord progression, you wanna know, okay, this is why the chord progression work because it comes from the cycle of fourth. So if I go from, let's say I'm playing in the key of C and I go from C to F and then all out of that I throw a B flat B flat major chord in that progression why how how is that B flat major fitting in this whole thing the theory now would explain that B flat major chord is the flat 7 for C and oftentimes you can go from the 4 to the flat 7 or from the flat 7 to the 4 because they're the flat seven in relationship, but also it's from the cycle of fourth. And you know that from C to B flat, I mean from C to F to B flat, from B flat to E flat, that's all cycled of fourth. And so knowing that is knowing the theory. And knowing the theory helps you to be able to memorize stuff like that quite easily. So when you have a bunch of progression that seems to be skipping all over the place in and out of the key, you want to be able to make sense of the relationship. If you see my last YouTube video upload on chromatic mediums, um, you know, I was reading through the comments and there were folks saying, you know, I've played those chords a million times and I always wonder why these chords work. How one is able to move from C major to E flat and it sounds so good because there's a chromatic median relationship there. So understanding little stuff like that is why it, 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 first of all, takes away the confusion, but then when it comes to memorization of chord progressions and songs, it's way easier for you to memorize because you understand the why. Why are these chords here? Why is that chord there, even though it's a non-diatonic chord? Why is D major in the key of C when it's supposed to be minor? Oh, it's because it's a secondary dominant that's propelling me to G. We call that the five of five or the secondary dominant passing or secondary dominant modulation. So all those little things. And I'm not saying you're gonna learn all of this overnight. I'm saying you gotta become a student of theory, never just pushing anything aside try to understand the why and you know I'm here if you guys come across anything that's complex or you just don't quite understand I'm just an email away I always respond when someone email me with questions like hey why does this work 
I always try to respond. Just don't send email asking me to write a book and give it to you on the concept. But if you have, you know, little questions about some chords that you can't really understand uh, why, shoot me an email. Uh, I'm free, I'm always welcome <clears throat> to respond to that. Ooh, I'm out of water. Gotta get some water soon. Um, so that's a theory. Another aspect of understanding the theory is knowing structures of a song, or what we call the form of a song. So when you're playing a song, does the song have an intro? How long is the intro? What's happening harmonically in the intro? Is it just the one, six, two, five, three times and then the song? How long is the verse? When I say long is the verse, I'm talking about how many measures, how many chord changes. Is it two chord changes per measure or is it just one? You know, you, you, know, you want to think through this from a sort of intellectual perspective. You know, coast yourself through the structure of the song. Is there a bridge? Is the bridge uh, carry the same chord progressions as the chorus or is it totally different? Does it incorporate non-diatonic chords, start going outside of the key? Another great aspect of theory is being able to hear passing chords differently from non-passing chords. So if you're listening to a song, you want to be able to say, this is a passing chord, this isn't. So we have the structural skeleton of a song, yeah? You want to be able to decipher what are the passing chords and what are the non-passing chords. And theory helps you to understand that. You don't have to know exactly what the chords are just yet. You just want to be able to identify what are the passing chords and what aren't. So in a nutshell, that's what the theory stuff helps you to do. Helps you to understand the why. And the why is important. You know, you want to understand the why. Why does this work? Why did it go to that chord and not this chord? Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? And the more you chased after that under, understanding of the why, the better you will get in not only learning songs quicker, but also being able to retain it. Jesus, this thing is annoying. Ah, I'm going to take it back. Oh, there we go. Now it won't fall again. So that's theory. What's the other thing in becoming a well-rounded pianist? What else do we need to learn and work on? The other thing is ear training. You also have to become a student of ear training. Where does my ear training journey begin? It starts from intervals. Intervals. What are intervals? Building blocks of music. Intervals is where everything begins. You know, if you talk about, you know, we talk about the human body is built on chromosomes and cells and all of that. Well, music is similar. Everything in music is built from intervals. <clears throat> and there are two types of intervals. There's secondary intervals and there's primary intervals. Our primary intervals and secondary intervals, yeah? Primary intervals are the intervals that are diatonic to the key. So if I'm playing in the key of C, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Those are the intervals that belong to C, or the notes that belong to C, and those would be diatonic intervals. So if I go from C, D, C, E, C, F, C, G, C, A, C, B, C, C. I just sung the intervals that's relating to the C. But I don't know what it meant actually. But I just sing the intervals that's relating to a major scale. And if you are able to do what I just did, then you're getting better at your intervals. And you want to be able to just sing those and have some fun with it. Mix it up, play it in different order. <coughs> so we have an interval of a major second, which is from C to D, interval of a major third, which is from 
C to E, interval of a fourth, perfect fourth, C to F, interval of a fifth, C to G, interval <coughs> of a major six, C to A, an interval of a major seventh, C to B, interval of an octave, C to C. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and so, knowing that theoretically, but also being able to hear that harmonically, or I should say melodically, is the beginning of understanding intervals. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, um, once you understand the primary intervals, which is what I just sound, then you want to look at the secondary intervals. Secondary intervals where the chromatic notes comes in. So from C to C sharp would be a minor second. C to E flat, a minor third. C to F sharp, a tritone, or an augmented fourth. C to G sharp, a minor sixth, or an augmented fifth. <coughs> C to B flat, a major seventh. I mean, a dominant seventh, or a flat seventh. Those intervals are a little bit harder to sing, and so, I would say to spend most of the time working on the diatonic intervals or the uh, within the major key. Why is it important to learn all of that? Well, once you know your intervals, you can hear the bass line of uh, the <laughs> you can hear the movement of bass line a lot e easier. And once you can hear how the bass is moving melodically, then you can go, oh, the bass should move from the one to the six. So if we're in the key of C, you know, it's from a C to an A minor. Because remember, we dictate chords or notate chords, figure out chords, simply by just listening to the bass movements. Because usually the bass is the more dominant uh, uh, frequency in the song, lower register, so you can really hear the bass movement clearly. And from just that alone, I can determine how the chords are moving. And that's the beginning of ear training being able to decipher chords by ear so when someone say how do i figure out the chords from a recording you start by listening to the bass movements figure that out it's easier for you to figure that out once you understand how intervals work and how the movements work so you see everything sort of ties in the other part of ear training which also it's kind of like theory is to be able to understand chords by numbers. You know, we talk about the number system. I rarely talk about chord progressions in relation to the key. I always talk about chords in relation to numbers. So you'll hear me say the one to the three, the three to the six, the six to the two, the two to the five. You wanna be able to make sense of that quickly. And why is it important to think in terms of numbers and not letters? is so that when the song changes key, the numbers don't change. The letters will change, but the numbers don't change. <coughs> and so you want to get used to thinking in terms of numbers. Because when musicians are communicating, like, you know, when I'm playing in services or in a band and it's a song that we haven't rehearsed, or we're just grooving and making things up randomly, we can communicate as it said, let's try, let's go to the flat seven. Let's go to the flat six. Let's go back to the one. Let's go to the three. And if we decide to change keys, we still keep those numbers rolling. And everybody can communicate by just understanding how those numbers are associated to chords. And so that's another thing you need to work on. So in a nutshell, that's where the air training journey begins. So we talked about theory, we talked about now ear training. The other thing we're going to talk about now is the actual practical mechanics. Because you know, you might have some theoretical understanding, or you might be able to hear some chords. But now putting it into practice is where everything, where we say the, the rubber meets the road, you know, to be able to put that into practice. And so these things right here. This is the vehicle of expression 
for us to be able to express what's in our hearts, what's in our minds, and what we're hearing, we need these to be working. And this is where a lot of people fall short. The technique, that's the other part. Developing technique. You can't hide from it. You know, if you look at a professional athlete, whether it's a runner, a football player, soccer player, you know, swimmer, for them to be efficient in their sport, they have to have good form and technique on the field. And so if you go to like a football, American football <clears throat> training, you'll see them doing all sorts of weird sprinting and going through cones and pushing weights and just sort of a regiment routine that they go through every day. They don't just go out on the field and start throwing ball and say, yeah, you know, we're practicing. No, they spend a lot of time in working on their form so that when they're on the field, they can move with efficiency and speed. Same thing for a soccer player. They don't just go out on the field and say, I'm going to start King Ball. Yeah, no, they got to work on their cardio so that they can, you know, endure a 90 minute sport. They got to work on their speed. They got to work on their form. They got to work on their structure. In high school, I did soccer and I did track and field. I was a pretty good jumper. jumper. I could, you know, high jump, long jump, triple jump. And we would do championships and stuff like that. And I remember every day after school for training, we would spend like an hour just working on form and technique. Little, little dashes, just working on form and technique. And so as pianists, <clears throat> we have to work on our form or our technique. You can't just sit down every day and say, I'm going to start playing a bunch of chords and playing songs and then that's it. Again, that's just one small aspect of developing your ability and your skills. You want to spend some of that time working on technique. And what are some of the techniques stuff you need to work on? The big one that nobody likes, scales. You gotta work on scales. I know it's boring and I'm like, you know, like I, 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 I don't see the importance of learning scales. Well, do you wanna be able to play licks and lines and runs? Do you wanna be able to improvise? I want to be able to do that. Now, how you think, do you want to be able to walk bass line with your left hand while your right hand is soloing and doing improvised lines? I want to be able to do that. Now, how you think players who can do that have to become a student of practicing scales. Improvised lines, licks and runs are all derivatives of scales. They come from a scale. And so the more you know your scales, the easier you can play lines and runs, the more flexible your hands become. Now, the four main scales always tell people to focus on. There are other scales, but if you can make these four your priority, all the other stuff becomes significantly easier. The major scale. Once you know your major scales, all 12 of them, really well, then you actually also know all the modes. When we talk about the Dorian, the Phrygian, the Lydian, the Mixolydian, the Aeolian, and the Locrian, those are modes that are derived from the major scale. <clears throat> Once you know you made the scale really well, then you actually know those modes also. So it's one hand wash the other. Or what we say, kill a bird with uh, kill two birds with one stone. Once you learn one, you learn the other. Yeah? So you learn the major scales. After that, I would say work on the minor scales. <clears throat> there are three forms of minor scales natural minor, harmonic minor, and melodic minor. And again, I have videos on all of this. Go learn the, uh, the minor scales also. Scale number three that you should learn, the pentatonic scale. Huge, the pentatonic scale I use every time I play. And so you, you wanna, you know, it's a five note scale. So in the key of C, C, D, E, F, A, C. That's the pentatonic scale. So you work on that also, yeah? And the last scale is the blue scale. Especially if you're a church pianist, you gotta get that blue scale under your belt. That's where that gospel sound comes from. It's from the blue scale. So major scale, minor scales, <clears throat> pentatonic scales, 
and the blue scales. If you can learn those four, you don't need enough to learn anything else, to be honest. Because if you want to be able to learn any other scales, you'll be able to quickly figure it out. Because every other scale is going to be a derivative of one of those scales, or just an alteration of one of those scales to give you a new scale. Four of those scales. And you don't want to sit there for hours and hours and hours practicing scales. No, that's not what I'm saying. In fact, I always tell people, if, you, if, you practice, if, you, if you're able to practice four days a week, four days, out of those four days, just spend like the first 10 minutes on some scales. That's it. It's not something you want to be overwhelmed with and trying to sit there hours and hours. Just 10 minutes when you practice. And that's it. Because this thing is a long game you're playing. If you're able to practice your scale for 10 minutes a day, <coughs> 10 minutes a day, for six months, you're gonna see dramatic changes in your playing. And that's the thing, you know, we're looking at the long run. You don't wanna cram too much in your days. Now, one of the biggest thing that a lot of people do incorrectly if they try to practice scales too fast. You know, when you see me run a scale really fast, I never practice scales at those speed, even though I can play them that fast. Today, I still don't practice scales at that speed. You never practice at the actual speed that you want them to play. Go slow, <clears throat> because the most important, important thing is the efficiency and control. Efficiency and control cannot be achieved when you're going that fast. Not to mention on the flip side, you're practicing anxiety because when you're trying to play it fast and you're slipping and you're fumbling and you're getting frustrated, can you imagine doing that for six months? The level of anxiety that you're practicing? You wanna be anxiety free. And to, pra and to be anxiety free when you're playing, you have to practice to be calm when you're playing. That starts by going slow. I used to sit at the piano <clears throat> when I have recitals in college and I just like, just get tense and nervous even though I'm the only one in the room. There's just a little bit of anxiety before I start to play and I didn't know why. Not to mention when I had to play on a stage in front of people, I'd be shaking like a leaf. And my teacher, after a while, says, you're practicing anxiety. And I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> Can someone practice anxiety? And she said, yes. And for like four lessons, she would just have me play. And she would sit and watch and take notes. And at the end of the class, she tells me all the things that I'm doing wrong. But because I've been doing these things for so long, they've been embedded in my subconscious. They become a sort of a part of my routine when I would play without me knowing. And it stems from because I was practicing too fast. When I sit in the practice room, I would try to play everything fast because I was obsessed with speed. You know, I would watch guys like Michelle Camillo and Herbie Hancock and Chikuria and you know um, Corey Henry oh, by the way I'm going to see Corey Henry this Wednesday he's coming to Portland Maine and boy I'm excited because I made sure to get the tickets for the he's doing a master class and I'm gonna try to video that stuff if they allow me to bring cameras in there and then I'll post it on YouTube for you guys to check out but anyway like these guys who play piano and they can just play fast and lines and runs and so I would try to emulate that and so I'd practice everything fast to think that's how I would be able to do it but in reverse you practice those things slow to the point where you have real control and that's when speed comes and so I just practice all my scales slowly after that when I, you know, I, 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 I was a classical piano major in college and so I would learn all the Beethoven and the Bach and I would drop those things same way, just slowly. And I'm not, it's not easy to play slow. It's not. It requires a lot of control and discipline. But hey, that's what you want. You want to be disciplined. 
and being calm, constantly checking in with you, yourself. Am I tight in my shoulders? Am I tight in my back? Am I tight in my wrist? You want your wrist to be fluid. Try to listen to yourself for any tension. Where's the tension in my body? And just relax it. And the more you practice that way, the easier it becomes to get in that state of mind. A relaxed state of mind and then eventually that will transition onto the stage when you have to play for services. When, you're, when you don't have any anxiety and you're relaxed, your mind is clear to think. To think about what run I want to play, what chord I want to play, do I want to use a passing chord there? You know, you're free to worship and enjoy the song. You're free to make decisions that will help you to lead the congregation in worship instead of focusing on you and your tension and the mistakes you're making. You make less mistakes and you're able to stay focused. You know, and let me just make a transition about worshiping. As a worship leader, and if you play for your church, you are a worship leader. It's your duty to be able to move the congregation in songs. And it's hard to do that. In fact, it's impossible to do that if you're focusing on you. You have to focus on the spirit and let the spirit work through you. You know, people talk about how do I play with emotions? Playing with emotions start by not focusing on you. Shift the focus from you and focus on something else. Focus on the audience, the listener. What is it I'm trying to convey? You know, what mood am I trying to create? Especially in a church setting, your sole goal is to put the congregation in a form of worship. Yeah, and you can't do that if you're focusing on you. You can't do that if you're tense and tight and you know freaking out up there with a bunch of anxiety, you know, shaking. And that stuff is something you have to practice off the stage before it will become a part of you on the stage. So that's just a side note on the psychological practice of being a musician, which is a whole different story. I'm gonna have to do a video on that because I used to be so nervous on stage I never thought I would get over it. Now, I play on stage with thousands of people in the audience and I don't feel any nerves. And I never thought I could get over it. And my teacher was a big part in helping me to get over it. And it first starts with how you practice. Your practice routine has a lot to do with how you play. Anyway, so the, I don't even remember what I was talking about. Jesus. Uh, <clears throat> What was I talking about again? <laughs> I sort of detoured. Um, yeah. Uh, practicing. Yeah, the mechanics. That's what I was talking about. So scale practicing. Practicing arpeggios. Practicing blocked chords. Practicing broken chords. And all of this I discussed in my course, Building Technique. I do that and I explain all of this. Technique has to be something that you place at the forefront. Gotta get serious and stop avoiding the work. If you split up the work in small portions and you just do it a little before you work on your songs every day, then you'll begin to incorporate technique. You know, a lot of you guys say, I don't have independence in my hands, you know? have the left hand do something different than the right hand you know that's because your technique again scale practice helps to solve that problem practicing left hand arpeggio right hand arpeggio helps to solve that I'm coming out with a course I'm hoping to get it released by the end of this month in the next two weeks or so and I call it rhythm chords for the beginner and the intermediate and it's where I teach you how to add rhythms broken chord rhythms to your progressions. And this course goes through all 12 keys and it covers just an amount, an enormous amount of rhythm exercises to add to your chords. So when you see me playing and I'm having all these cross rhythms, I break that down so the beginner and the intermediate can achieve that in short progressions. So that's a side note. So that uh, will help you guys with rhythms. 
but you know just remember that technique is the vehicle through which you express your emotions and musical decisions let me say that again technique is the vehicle through which you express your musical emotions musical decisions without good technique it's going to be hard for you to sound musical just imagine someone that has a stutter when they speak just imagine how difficult it is for that person to express their thoughts and their feelings and their emotions because they can't speak that well now when you don't have uh, you know a good ground on your technique it's the same stutter you'll experience you can't really express the things you're feeling and hearing because your hands are not there yet and so you will become a student of technique yeah and so that those are the areas to becoming a rounded musician. Those are the things you really have to focus on and think about. You know, next month or within the next six weeks or so, I'm going to be coming out with some new series. And this is going to be paid programs, by the way, on my website. But I'm going to be coming out with some new series that really focuses on stru uh, structural practice sessions. So I'm going to walk with you on a day-to-day -day basis through videos of practicing. And this is, these are going to be materials and courses for beginner, intermediate, and intermediate advanced. So you know what you should be working on each level. And these are going to be a series of courses released every month. Because I realize that, you know, what a lot of you guys are missing out on are structure. There's no structure. And without structure and systems, it's hard to move forward. And so what I want to help you guys to create a system that you can embed in your daily routine. And then once your body and your mind get uh, comfortable with that system, we can replicate it over the span of weeks, months, and years. Because if every time you sit at the piano, you really don't know what you're doing, you don't really have a system to follow, you don't have a structure, then you don't have something that you can replicate. You know, the body likes systems. <clears throat> I mean, if you take your day and you look at your days, you realize that there's a lot of similarities. You probably wake up at the same time. You have a sort of routine that you do after you wake up. You know, you have set you know, you, you eat breakfast at a particular time, you go to work or you go to school, and you have a system that you replicate each day. There might be some minor changes, but for the most part, we all have a system that we follow in our daily lives. And it's why our lives are nice and comfortable, because we know what the next day is going to be like. We know what to expect. We know what to work on, you know, systems. And you want to create something like that similar for piano where you have a system that you can replicate and follow and that's when you'll start to see true growth without a system without something to replicate you're just going to sort of bounce over the place and you're wondering why you're not making much progress it's not that you don't have the knowledge the intellect or the musicality to make it happen it's that you have not yet figured out a system that works for you because everybody's got to tweak their own system because everybody's life is different you know so it's my goal that through these videos and talks whether you're a part of my paid program or not just hanging out on YouTube is that I can help you create systems you know there's a lot to piano playing it is a lot and I'm not gonna lie it is a lot and partly that's why it's overwhelming but also most importantly, it's why we need systems. So we can take this giant mountain, break it down into systems that we can replicate over weeks, months, and years. You know, and so when you wake up five years later, you can see immense progress in your playing. Whether you want to become a professional musician or you're a retired person at home, just want to you know, continue learning, doing music is fun. 
or you want to be a better gospel musician for your church and your environment systems it's what's going to make it easier for you and more fun but also to be able to see your progress because without progress we will get frustrated and we will lose interest you know and i don't want you guys to lose interest because i'm telling you music is a beautiful thing you know beautiful once i mean just to be able to sit and just even entertain yourself when you know you can really express the things you're feeling and hearing and you can hear that comes out it's a beautiful thing i oftentimes surprise myself when i play because things come out that i didn't expect it you know i didn't plan on it but that's because i have built up myself to the level where almost anything i hear i can replicate and that wasn't always easy. It's something that I've chased for years. Because I remember I would play and I would hear things and I couldn't figure out what it, where it is on the piano. Or I couldn't figure out what chord that was that I was sort of hearing, but I, I couldn't figure it out. But it's something, it's this elusive thing that I continually chased, chased after. And I feel like now I'm finally at the, at the par, at the level where I can understand what I'm doing. When I play, when I hear things, I can find it quickly. You know, I can find chords and runs and licks and lines to express what I'm feeling. But it all started first by chasing, becoming a student of theory, becoming a student of ear training, and becoming a student of technique building. Ooh, it's getting dark. I hope you guys can see me. You know, that's where it all starts from. Remember a few, video, few weeks back, I do a YouTube live where I said, it's never. So when you're trying to work on different areas, just remember, it's never just one thing. It's always been one thing that is necessary to becoming a rounded pianist. All right? I'm having some fuzzy life connection stuff going on here, guys. Yeah. So, I feel like that was a good amount of nuggets for you guys for today. So, as you go on on your Saturday today, I hope that first of all, you guys will be safe. You know, take care of yourself out there on the road. But I want you to ponder these things that we discussed today. Music is something you live, not something you do. You gotta live music, and that means that even when you're away from the piano, you wanna be thinking about music and working on music mentally and orally, singing stuff, you know? At the end of my videos, when I say keep listening, keep singing, and keep practicing, it's a mantra, mantra I want you guys to embed in your life. Become a student of singing. It's not about trying to become a good singer. It's about being able to hear things and utter it with the voice in an accurate pitch that you're hearing it. You gotta keep listening, you gotta keep singing, and you gotta keep practicing. And your practicing should be routines. If you, if you speak to any fairly sport active person, they have routines. They don't just get up every day and go out on the field and just do random stuff. They have a set of routines that they follow and that they replicate because they're training their body to function almost uh, on autopilot when they're out there on the field. And that's how you eventually want to train your mind, your ears, and your fingers to function on autopilot when you're playing so that you can make more musical decisions without you know, your fingers getting in the way. All right? So as always, I love you guys. Thank you for hanging out with me on a Saturday morning. I'll try to do more frequent, you know, at least once a week live streams to just talk about stuff, encourage you guys, because I know it's a lonely road being a musician, being a pianist, trying to, you know, grow. It can be a lonely and tedious road. And I wanna be your guide. I wanna be your motivator and to encourage you that, you know,
things are getting better. You're not the same person you were a year ago. You're a better player today. And if you just continue to push along, you wake up one day and all the things you wanted to be able to do, you'll be able to do it. But you gotta become a student of all those areas. A student of your training, a student of theory, a student of technique building. All right? So until then, this is Warren tuning out. Have a wonderful day. Keep listening, keep practicing, and uh, keep playing. And I'll catch you soon in the next video, all right? So bye. <laughs> Take care, guys.